We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara Messi,
I, I moved to this house because um, it's, it's relevant to the cup final. 30 years this summer, which is unbelievable, isn't it? Wow. Yeah, I remember it was the first cup final that I watched. How, how, old were you, how old were you then? I was eight years old. They say that eight is about the first time you can remember a cup final. When I look back now, I had no idea of what type of game it was at that young age, like the, the two contrasting styles and then how dominant Liverpool were. No, I mean, people forget. I mean, I, I, when I speak to players, or I, you know, when I was managing and spoke to players, you know, over the last, people forget 20, I mean, the fact they've never won the league title is amazing, but in the 80s, in the late 70s, early 80s, Liverpool were the dominant team, not just in the in, in England, but in Europe. Um, but for their expulsion from, um, or but for the expulsion of British teams after Heysel from from Europe, they'd have probably accumulated another, another couple if not, you know, two or three more European cups to their name, and be right up there at the top of the uh, top of the standard. But um, you know, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it, it was it. They were the they were. I keep saying the They were the Man They were the Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea of their day. But they, they that team rolled into one. You know, those three teams rolled into one. How much tactical preparation went into that specific game back then? There was a lot. I mean, people forget, despite the fact you know people tag this as a ragtag you know, team. I mean, we had a lot of good players in our team, a lot that went on to be internationals thereafter. But we also had in Don Howe, the England coach. He was he worked he was assistant manager at Wimbledon and he was he was the English coach at the, at the same time. So, you know, we we did an awful lot of tactical work. I mean I remember when Don joined Wimbledon, he said, I don't particularly like how you play because we are very direct, we are very physical, we were a little bit we, we pushed the rules to what they could be used for. And he said, I'm not particularly enamoured with the way you play, having come from the Arsenal school of thinking, you know. But he said, what I will do as a coach is I will try and attempt to make you better at what you do do because you have such belief in it. And he did sessions around, um, you know, that that would benefit what we were doing and make us more efficient at it, if you want. And, you know, I always say to people, I mean, obviously Don sadly passed away now, but I think Don learned as much in his two years at Wimbledon than he probably did in other places because it was such a culture shock to him about what, what we were doing. Um, so a lot of preparation went to that final, you know, specifically that John Barnes, who at the time was PFA player of the year, league managers player of the year, the best player in the country at the time. That Beardsley, that Aldrich. I mean, their, their team was full of international Hansen and Ablett at the back. You know, that they were they had quality coming out of them. We did an awful lot of work about stopping them playing out from the back which people forget did happen in the old days. It wasn't just, um, it isn't a modern phenomenon that people play out from the back, but Liverpool had people like Hansen, who was, you know, superb on the ball and they liked to play through him. So we stopped, we stopped that line of, that line of coming out for them. Um, we stopped John Barnes, who was in his pomp at the time from being, you know, doing what he did best um, by doubling up on him. And we did, we did lots of tactical work with regard to Liverpool. I mean, it wasn't just turn up and beat them because, um, even in those days, that wasn't you know that wasn't the way things were done. I watched the post game interviews last night. Very very funny, just how different it was back then. But interesting when Don Howe and Bobby Gold came on. Don said he, he had a bit of a pop at um, at the BBC guys. He's like people look down their nose at people who want to work and graft. Do you think we still do that today with some forms of football? You know the thing that made me smile the the, the most was that when Leicester won the league because. Leicester were direct. They had the worst. They I say the worst. They had the least possession of any team in the Premier League that season. But they played it back to front very quickly. They had a forward in Vardy that was very, very quick and very direct. And they upset a lot of teams. I mean, they won the league by ten points. People forget. Um, so we were. I mean, we were. Uh, we we didn't help ourselves to a certain extent. We we were rugged and we were big. We were a big team. We were very physical. We were brilliant at set plays, both offensively and defensively. We did all the ugly stuff. We had the long throw. We had a long throw. We had did all the ugly stuff in football that now you see coming back into fashion to a certain extent. I see Liverpool are now an employed a long ball coach. You know, uh, um, we were we we had Vinny Vinny. I wouldn't say he was one of the first, but he certainly his throw was was quite tremendous. And that we got a lot of flick-ons and goals from that type of thing. Set plays that, you know, come in with England in, during the World Cup about all oh, set plays. We knew they were important 30 years ago. We, we were experts at set plays. We scored a, far, a large percentage of our goals by by being big and strong and knowing what we were doing in set plays. We had people like Dennis Wise, who was an excellent te- technician in those days. Um, you know, he, he could put the ball on the sixpence. So a lot of the things that 
it's funny because people always think modern football is the best football and that before that there was nothing uh, it's a bit like the Premier League that there didn't exist football 100 years before that of course there existed football of course there existed good coaches of course there existed ways of doing stuff um, prior to what's being done now pressing at the front we used to press at the front all the time we we press from the front big time we chased teams down we cut off goalkeepers so they couldn't pass back to their goalkeeper we locked defend we locked fullbacks into into their into their um when they when they're facing their own goal back into their little court so they couldn't turn and get out we did all the things that you see today and, you, and it does make me laugh to think you know it's all considered new stuff um because i'm thinking well it was not that new that's for sure <laughs> that that culture, that crazy gang culture. People talk about the class of ninety two, but you know, I'm I'm fascinated with a group of people who from lower league that went on to play for their country, captain their country, manage their country, world record transfer fees, captain Chelsea, Hollywood movies. W- what was so special of what produced those types of characters? It's a strange one. I mean, I, people always ask me this. We, I, I just think sometimes in life. It comes together, uh, a unique group group of individuals come together at a unique club managed by a unique person just just at the right time. And and we we all came together from various backgrounds, from Vinnie Hodcarrier in Watford, from Fash, sons of Nigerian princes, prince somewhere, you know, um, via Bernardo's, from uh, Dennis Wise from Shepherd's Bush down the road, to myself from... Um, a middle class background and, uh, and a stalwart at Reading, you know Dave Besson from uh, Wheelstone, and you know literally born within the sight of the the tw- Twin Towers, and coming to coming to work on a moped when he was six foot four. You can imagine can imagine how he looked coming to work on a moped, and that group of players just came together at that exact time, and over a course of ten years, tore the football book up. Um, Broached. I mean, I always remember we went to um, we, we we got invited to this. I don't know what it was. This this tournament, this mid season tournament in San uh, San Sebastian, or Santander. Sorry, um, we were playing Real Madrid. Real Madrid, Santander, and us in a three way tournament. Each played forty five minutes, so you all got a game out of it. So you played a half against Santander, half against Real Madrid, then Real Madrid played a half against Santander. So it was a full game. We um, we were leading Real Madrid at the time, one nil for a long spate of that forty five minutes before they got a couple of late goals. We were we were, you know, if we'd have been in Europe, which we'd have qualified for the champ or for the for the Cup Winners Cup that year, we'd have torn 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 up a whole, um, you know, we'd torn up trees through Europe that year. It'd been, it'd been interesting to see us play in Europe, you know. Um, and that's the one thing of all that that I do regret that we weren't given the chance to compete against in the European in the European campaign because we would have taken our story further than just um, the confines of the English league. The BT Sport documentary on the Crazy Gang really really enjoyed it, but it kind of opened my eyes to a different side of it. We were thinking of, or I was thinking of the pranks and hiding, cutting people's shoes and all that there, but. It looked as if life was very hard at Wimbledon. If you couldn't break into the group, you weren't accepted. It was a tough school. Um, I often say to people, today you'd say verge on the verge of bullying to a certain extent, some of the stuff that went on with regard to what were considered weaker characters at the time. Um, and I, 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 even now I look back on it and I think some of the stuff that went on perhaps shouldn't have gone on or perhaps we should have taken a stronger line being the stronger uh you know, being the more forceful ones in the dressing room. But it was a survive. It was a survive. I mean, I remember speaking to Dave Bassett once about it. And um, his argument was, if you couldn't survive the dressing room, what chance had you of surviving in front of 72,000 people at Old Trafford? You know, when we had our backs against the wall with a team whose wage bill was about flaming one-tenth of theirs. You know, you had to have people that were that could stand up to, stand up to that type of... Um, and the one one of the ways they did it was that there was a, a you know a Darwinian thing in the dressing room. We, there was a there was a survivor of the strongest to a certain extent, and, and f- people fell by the wayside. I mean, I know John Scowers wasn't very happy with his portrayal in that in that documentary um, because it didn't reflect very well on him. But I mean, you know, John then went on to Liverpool, became Player of the Year at Liverpool, four and a half million pound signing, went on to Tottenham, did a great job there, had a great career out of it. But he probably doesn't look back at his Wimbledon time with great affection because he did have a very, very tough time there. You know, certain people fell by the wayside. Ian Holloway was there for Wimbledon for a year. People don't even realise that Ian Holloway was there for a year. 
a lot of things conspired against Ian. You know, he had problems um, in his home life with regard to his wife being ill and the children and such like. But um, he had to go back to Bristol Rovers back in the third division before Jerry Francis brought him to QPR and he had 10 great years at QPR with Ray Wilkins. Yet he found the school at Wimbledon and if, he ever, if you ever ask him about Wimbledon, he, he doesn't look at it with any affection whatsoever because it was a tough time for him. Do you think in building top players and successful people, that resilience, you know, the, the bullying aside from it, that we need that resilience even though we don't like it? There's two schools of thought on that today, isn't it? Today the thought is, no, everything should be should be um, be all empathetic, that you should all be in it together and be spoke, talked to. It's it's a different. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to sort of justify it, but it's a different era today. Um, we couldn't do the stuff. We certainly not with modern media, modern social media, modern uh, cameras and everything. We couldn't do the stuff that we did thirty years ago. You couldn't get away with that now. But whatever happened, uh, you know, people still talk about a group of players that. I mean, I remember speaking to a friend afterwards. His friend who was a journalist, he said that cup final won't be remembered. The goal wasn't that great a goal. The game wasn't particularly particularly good. And since then, I've done about three or four documentary on it. We've had a BT film, and every year, come cup final week, I'm dragged out somewhere to give a discussion. You know, talk about it. So you know, it is remembered. It is one of those special. The, the, the crazy gang against the culture club, literally, and, and and on so many different levels, we were so inferior that we had to do something different to match that up. And sometimes some of the stuff to get to that props today wouldn't be considered appropriate, you know? Moving on to management then, you did something pretty unique for a professional footballer. You you studied a degree at university, management science at Loughborough. I did. Were you- I'm, just, I'm just starting an MBA um, oh. next week in, at Salford University in, in Manchester and I'm chief executive. Oh, congratulations. Executive. You know, I've always enjoyed education, always enjoyed learning. Was that to prepare you as a manager, Laurie, or was that to open door for business opportunities? To be fair at the time, I mean, I, I was playing the lower league side. I mean, how long my career would be, I didn't know. I'd always wanted to go to university to be first in my family to go to university. I got an offer from Loughborough and I went to the manager at Reading. So I stayed, I, I finished my, I finished day level, I did my A-levels. I actually played for Reading when I was doing my A-levels. Ironically, made my debut against Wimbledon against Wimbledon um, with Dave Bassett, who like, became my manager, playing against me in the middle of the field. I stayed on the fo- When I finished my A-levels, um, I joined Reading for a year. We got promoted. At the end of that year, I got offered a place at Loughborough. And um, I said to the manager, manager, I want to go to Loughborough. And he said, no worries, Laurie. I, th- I thought, well, that's my football career pretty much at an end. And he said, we'll give you a three-year contract. I signed a three-year contract. I used to travel down every weekend to, to Reading, play, go back to Loughborough and study during the week. I mean, it worked out extremely well you know for those three years I was pretty much a regular in the team but it, with regard to future management um, you know I wasn't thinking at that stage about it I was just thinking I needed to have something in my back pocket if my football career didn't take off when we start coaching we tend to take a lot of what we did when we were players into our early years did, sure, you, yeah. did you try and replicate the crazy gang um, did I I've got to say, I mean, I, I, although I was, I was, I'm tagged as a member of that crazy gang. I, I was always on the periphery, looking. In. I was, I wouldn't say I was ever at the centre of what was going on, not with regard to the the antics that perhaps people remember and talk about. But I mean, I, I, I won't, I won't say I wasn't involved, but I was certainly not a major. I, I mean, I was a periphery member. Um, certainly on the football field, I was there to be counted. But off off the field, some of the antics, I, I did look at them and think, really, but. That said, um, I don't think you can recreate that. I think I think the style of football or the, in, the, the the actual football that we played and the way it was played and and the thoughts behind it, I think are, are still very much. And I said to you, Leicester um, proved it the other year that you can still be direct and still be successful um, if everybody buys into that scenario. Um, unfortunately, um, to a certain extent, it's uh, considered passe in, in this day of ticky tacky football. Um, so. Some of the stuff I, I, I certainly carried into my managerial career. Um, I was never able, I don't think, to generate an atmosphere that we like we had in 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 the Wimbledon dressing room. In that we're all in this all in this together. Although we did have a cup run with Wickham, and to a certain extent, we had some results with Northern Ireland that on their day, you know, stood stood in stood in their place for that. But um, as a natural dressing room, I don't think um, I don't think I've ever seen a dressing room exactly like we had at Wimbledon. No. 
so Northern Ireland, let's talk about changing a culture, taking over at Northern Ireland. 1,300 minutes without scoring a goal, hadn't won a game for three years. W- what were the first areas you addressed taking over? Well, my first area, I mean, I said I t- when I took over, there was three things I wanted to do, which was score a goal, which we did in our first game, although we lost um, 3-1 to Norway, I think it was. Um, the next thing I said was we wanted to win a game. Um, which we did in the game after that when we I think we beat um, Estonia away with a David Healy brace. And then the next thing I said was we wanted to improve the world rankings. And over the course of my time there, I mean, we went up 97 places. And, you know, when I left, I think by that stage, um, you know, they thought, the team thought that they could beat most people and, and had beaten Spain. Um, we beat in England. Uh, we beat Spain just before they went on their three tournament wins. Um, we beat England in the qu- first time for a qualifying campaign for generation. Um, you know, we bridged a hundred position gap to beat them and 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 deserve to win as well that game. So we we achieved a lot of things in Northern Ireland. I think I think the major thing we did was that the players from going from not wanting to turn up for some of them because they were getting beaten all the time and going back to their clubs and getting ribbed about it to players turning up. Then we went through the next phase of players actually winning games, and then we got to the next phase of. When I left, they were top of their World Cup qualifying group um, with a chance of going to that World Cup. Unfortunately, they, they slipped down and didn't and finished third. But I think it put into one or two of the players' minds, especially the younger players who I brought into the team, Steve Davis um, and such like that, uh, Johnny Evans, that, you know, it wasn't beyond the realms. Whereas before, when I took over a group that finished bottom of their group and scored a goal and won a game, yet somehow it accumulated four points, I think, which was quite an achievement on that basis. From, they, from that situation, they went to a situation where ultimately they qualify for a European Championship under Michael and, you know, not far off the World World Cup this time round as well, which was, you know, disappointing in the way it panned out. But I think that the change of mentality of the players or a lot of the players in that team, they believed what they could achieve rather than what they couldn't achieve. During that time, I took a coaching course in Belfast and you presented a session on attack and play. And then he gave a presentation on why you were doing it. I remember it so well. It was the first time I would ever have heard numbers associated with the game. You charted penalty box entries and you gave specifics on how you wanted crosses over hit and the balls recycled back into a disorganized penalty area. Um, yeah. 13, 14 years later, Laurie, have your thoughts changed on the game? Um. I, th- I think they're basic facts of life in, 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 in football. I, I think how you play or how you achieve it can be done differently, obviously, I mean, depending on what you say. But I see I see now, I see Mende play for Man City and I see Mende, um, I like Mende, I've, I've only seen him play two or three times, you know, on TV. He's crossing balls first time. I mean, he's coming on and whacking balls and he crosses terrific balls across the face of the goal. You know, the Arsenals of this world never crossed the ball. You didn't have to defend crosses with Arsenal. Um I remember playing, uh, if I tell you a story about Aaron Hughes, I mean, on the Saturday, no, sorry, on the Saturday, we we played, I can't remember we played, I think we lost to someone, um, and he cut his, he cut his eye, and um, the doctor said, I would have to go home, because he had about eight stitches in his eye, I said, why would he have to go home? He said, well, he can't play. I said, why not? He said, well, he can't hit a ball. I said, we're playing Spain on Wednesday. He ain't going to have to hit a ball. And we beat Spain 3-2 that, that Wednesday night. Um, and Aaron Hughes um, had headed one ball that night. That's all he had to head. He didn't pull out of headers. He just it was the one ball he had to head. Um, uh, so, you know, what that said was that Spain weren't exploiting an area. They they thought they were so good that they couldn't. They weren't exploiting an area of, of width and crosses um, when they had people. Um, you know, when people in the box. So if you're going to cut that route off, you have to be very very good at a lot of other routes not to have that that route. I think crossing is a is a, a crossing a, is an intricate part of football. I see Pep uses it now. I mean, I see, you know, when Arsenal when Arsenal played under Wenger, they never used it ever. They never crossed the ball. They always came back inside. I see, I see Arsenal, I see Man City now with Mendy. He doesn't think twice. He's crossing ball, so he's obviously been told to do that. So Pep himself is saying, yeah, you know, crosses have always been in part and part of football. Let's get him in the box when we got the opportunity. Get him in early. Get him. you haven't got to have big centre forwards. You get the ball in early behind. You saw Shaw's goal for England the other day when he set up Rashford. Fantastic cross from the left back, across the back of the back four, um, and Rashford can come onto it. So that that went out of fashion for a long time, crossing balls into the box, because unless you had a big centre forward, you thought you couldn't achieve it. And obviously the growth has been to small 
the Agueras of this world, you know, type centre forwards. But um, it's coming back in the fashion led by people like Pep. So my, my feelings about football haven't changed an awful lot. I think I'm not particularly, I'm not particularly a pass it out of the back man. I don't particularly, I think that style of play can be stopped. Um, and Liverpool showed that against Man City when they pressed them right up the field and destroyed them. So I think it can be stopped. Um, obviously, when you've got a goalkeeper like Emerson that can flame and now deliver a ball 60 yards straight to your forward's chest, it gives you another out. Um, and exploiting that other out is, um, is is important. But the one thing I would say is that if, if a team's very good at one thing, um, stop them doing that thing and make them do something they're not very, very good at. So... <laughs> What happened a lot was that the good teams that passed in the back, they got really pressed deep and down. And of course, then they were kicking the ball long and they weren't very good at it. Now, with the, goal, with the goalkeepers being told to be more technical, you are getting goalkeepers and now can get around that by picking out players 60 yards up the field, which is, you know, which is another thing in their armour. So, you know, the game is always evolving. I, 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 it's, it, you know, there's nothing new. Someone said to me, there's nothing new in football. And there isn't. There's nothing new in football. It's just... A fashion of what goes, what is in, and what goes around, and um, you know, as I say, you, you see it with a throwing coach at Liverpool now. It's supposed to be state of the art. Well, um, we perhaps didn't have a throwing coach, but we certainly knew what throwings were about when we were playing, and we knew that they were important both for and against, and that you know you needed to win them back very, very quickly when other teams had them, and you made sure when you had the ball, you didn't give them away, or if you did, you were giving it away because you were trying to create a goal-scoring opportunity. So, and the other thing, of course, from that thing is now stats are the build and end all of football, aren't they? You know, with Opta and EA, um, everything is analysed to the nth degree. Um, and I, I was reading something the other day that there are so many stats now, the interpretation of those stats is the most important thing. You know, midfielders can have 100% record passing 100 balls, but if the ball passes to their centre back and then back to them, I wouldn't say it was. It, I didn't wouldn't say it helped the game. Now, if their pass was in for, into a forward scored a goal, then obviously that has more credence than one that goes back to the centre half as it's recycled back to them. Um, and you know, the interpretation of stats are now so important. But I think that the basics, you know, you do need a certain number of entries into a final third to score goals. Obviously, the best teams need less for final third entries than the teams lower down in the league, but there, there are still, there are still connections between the one and the other. Yeah. Just on what you were saying earlier about the, about teams today, uh, wanting that set piece advantage and that Wimbledon team that again, that, that interview after the cup final, Don Howe said you spent two hours working on set pieces the day before a cup final. We, we spent, we spent every week working on set plays. We, we weren't making up set plays of that, for that on that day we were just um restyling them or m making sure we were doing the runs right or you know reinforcing what we'd already done and you know that was the end of a season by the end of the season you don't spend you don't spend two hours on new free kicks we were just reinforcing free kicks but literally <laughs> ironically i scored in the last game of the home home against chelsea the previous week at plough lane with a free kick similar so you know it was just reinforcing those things um and the anal analysis in then wasn't as good as it is now i mean you, you, you know I scored 25 goals when I was at Wimbledon. I mean, if there's five or six of those goals on, on tape somewhere, I'd be amazed because there wasn't, you know, there wasn't the, the recollection there is now, you know, the video, the digital data where you could video every goal a kid, a kid scored from 15 onwards and he'll have it in his record book. Um, in those days, you, people went and watched, they wrote it down and then they sent it to the club. By the time the club read it and digested it, it could translate several times. But nowadays, you would never get away with scoring that type of goal because that's what we did week in, week out and they'd, they'd have stopped it. Last question for you. Obviously, with, with your path, you believe in working your way up. You believe in the education side. What's your advice for young coaches who want to progress in the game today? To go on courses. Um, to be fair, you, you, modern, not so much for what you learn, because as I say, you often go to courses and think, well, I've learned a lot there. But for the people you meet at those courses, because on, on your way up, um, it's, it's always important to to, to interact, to socialise with people that perhaps, you know, at some stage in the future might remember you, might you might be able to use as a contact to get somewhere. So, um that, that is important for young coaches. So get yourself on courses, see the bits you like and the bits you don't like, things you, bits you can use, but also socialise. Don't just go stand at the back of the queue and go out and talk to other people. Football people are football people. They talk to everybody, you know. They're, everybody has the same sort of problems, whether you be at Man City or I mean, uh, Macclesfield. It's, 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 uh, so, and they're happy to discuss those with you. I mean, I'm sure if I wrote to Pep Guardiola to go come watch training, he'd say, yeah, sure, come in, come in. Not ma in many other industries, that wouldn't happen, you know. The better they are, usually the more open they are. 
well, the better they are, the less the less worried they are about you um, nicking their jobs. That's for sure, um, <laughs> because they they know you ain't going to come and take their jobs. So I understand lower down if you're a you know, if I was to phone up someone at say, you know, Macclesfield and say, can I come in and watch training? The first thing the manager be thinking, why is he coming in? And the chief, chief executive saying, well, what's he coming in? So there is that sort of worry about your job lower down, but at the top level people are quite open. I mean, you know, the Klops and Guardiola's and uh, of this world are. Are quite happy to show you what they do because by the time you learn what they do, they've refined it even further. You know, mm. plus you're unlikely to have the players they've got to do it. So that 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 that's the other that's the other scenario. That part of that scenario. Brilliant, Laurie. Thank you so much for your time and insight today, and a special thank you for beating England back in the day. That was a big one. <laughs> no, you know, thanks for um, the interview and good luck to you. Thanks so much to Laurie. There, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, brilliant insight into one of the toughest and most overachieving cultures that that you'll find in sports i've been studying the game for a few years and studying different sports and trying to pick up on these different cultures and i still don't think there's anything like that wimbledon in the 1980s and it's sometimes it's a throwaway because of the style of football and, and we've turned into a little bit of football snob some days where we want the culture to be aligned with the style of play of pep guardiola but I think there's a real togetherness about that team and I think those those people achieved individually and collectively a lot more than a lot of people would have predicted they would have. So um, that was brilliant. Loved hearing about that there. One of the takeaways for me with Laurie was it was a couple of days since I recorded this and I wanted to, to take those couple of days to think about this one because I disagreed with him at the time about the way that culture was shaped the way it was and it almost sounded from Laurie that it was just a case of everything clicking at the right time and and I'm not a big believer in luck or in things happening just a group of people coming together and liking each other and results going that way I think football's a lot harder than that there so that's why I want to take a couple of days and and in, in thinking about it you know I can see where he's coming from I think there's so many variables to a culture and they got all those variables right. And some of them were intentional, which would have been their style of play. I think their recruitment, I think their in their daily behaviours in terms of their work rate and not dealing with anyone being bigger than the club. I, I would recommend anyone watching the BT Sport documentary on it because, again, we talk about cultures. We think the cultures is people coming together and agreeing with one another. But that was very much, um, in the, in the documentary, you've got Laurie, and John Fashionu's story and, and they, they weren't exactly best friends and how they worked alongside that there to get the best out of one another and come together for the team is is really, really powerful. So really enjoyed that there. The other side of it, of course, was what Laurie was saying there about the principles of the game not going out of fashion. And again, two days since I recorded that, I went back and watched that cup final, that 1988 cup final. And we'd recommend that you do it if you can get beyond the back passes and the offside rules. You know, a lot of the game has there's a lot of similarities in terms of the way that team compressed space. And and I always look I watched it thinking, if that was played today, what would we be saying about that there? And and the pressing from Wimbledon, the work rate from Wimbledon, the intensity from Wimbledon was absolutely brilliant. So um, yeah, we don't have to find inspiration from every Saturday. You know, football didn't start five to ten years ago. There's a lot of good stuff in the game that maybe we should be looking at a little bit closer and taking a little bit more insight from people who were successful from a different generation. So really enjoyed that there. Um, thanks so much for listening. would love to know your thoughts on it, uh, what you agreed with, what resonated with you, maybe things you didn't agree with, um, anything like that there. Always love to hear your thoughts. Um, on Twitter at Gary Kernin, on Instagram at Gary Kernin. Please, please, please just shoot a rating out, a five star rating for the podcast. We'd be very appreciated. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. See you soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, Head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.